Thank you for listening to Lone Star Community Radio. This program was broadcasted and recorded live from the LSCR studios in downtown Conroe, Texas. Lone Star Community Radio is supported by listeners like you. Donate and sponsor today. For more information on getting involved with Lone Star Community Radio, contact us at lscrstudios at gmail.com or visit us online at www.irlonestar.com. You're listening to Crime Scene today. We talk about future and current issues affecting law enforcement, crime scene, and forensic investigations. I'm your host, Dan Zintek. Joining me today, Nazmia Kamri, a sociologist from the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Community Oriented Policing Services. She provides leadership for the development, implementation, and delivery of technical assistance efforts to state, local, tribal, campus, and territorial law enforcement agencies across the country is a program manager for the Collaboration Reform Initiative, Technical Assistance Center, Critical Response Programs, Mazmia co-authored the Critical Incident Review, Active Shooter at Robb Elementary. We also have Laura McElroy, who is a leading communication strategist for law enforcement and nationally recognized communication consultant. She specializes in helping agencies respond to critical incidents and the transparent accountability measures that promote legitimacy. Laura was a member of the DOJ team that conducted the critical incident review of law enforcement response to the Uvalde shooting. She also serves subject matter expert for the Major Cities Chief Association, IACP, and an instructor for Perth Senior Management Institute of Police. And coming back again, she's been on a previous episode, Judy Powell has served as the police executive of both Canada and the U.S. more than 25 years. Most recently, she served as assistant commissioner for the New York Police Department. She's conducted crisis training for thousands of law enforcement professionals, including FBI Regional Command College across the country. In the summer of 2022, she consulted with Interpol's Project Stadia on crisis communication prior to the World Cup. Powell authored the 2023 COPS Office Guide to Strategic Communication for Law Enforcement Executive and holds a master's degree in public relations. I would like to thank all of these professionals for coming in and sharing their knowledge uh, with our listeners. We're going to cover critical communication. We're going to be talking about uh, what to do for an incident, what to do after an incident, how to manage uh, your messaging. And I know that we have three guests on that are incredible at doing this or teaching around the nation and that the nation looks to during these critical incidents and disaster on how to do them better. Uh, So starting with uh, Nazmia, I know that you work for the U.S. Department of Justice, Community Oriented Policing Services, and you have helped already on many critical incidents. Uh, One that you had co-authored, the active shooter at Robb Elementary, and I know that you will be speaking uh, on lessons uh, from tragedy and grapevine in reference to the Uvalde shooting. Whenever something comes to you, whenever you receive one of these incidents, what I guess, what are the first steps? What's the overall approach into looking at this? Obviously, we can't correct what has happened uh, afterwards. Uh, We can only learn from it, and hopefully, if you're called early enough, uh, possibly uh, to help in the process. So how do you process this? What's your first steps, or what's the process along the way? Well, great question, and, and thank you so much for having me as part of this discussion. So Initially, it's a lot of research. It's really understanding the incident. It's understanding what is currently out there in terms of the information. It's also for for the work that we do at the COPS office, the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, which is a a component of the U.S. Department of Justice, all of our work is voluntary. So we're also looking to see, do we have a request from an agency, from a law enforcement executive? Um, so that, we, do we have the request? What is the research? What are we looking on that aspect of it? Do we have a responsive agency? And then it's really pulling together a team. And so I'm really excited that Laura is here on this call today because um, at the COPS office, we recognize that we have to have a multidisciplinary team. We have to bring in the experts from the field. And so in particular with the work that we did on the critical incident review, we brought together 10 subject matter experts, wide variety of different areas of expertise, and Laura was one of them, and I think you, you'll really ex- experience just, just a bit of her expertise on this and then with future presentations. Um, but it was important to bring that team together and then to really have collaborative conversations about the way that we were gonna approach this work. 
And so I'll pause there so I don't take too much more time, but uh, really it's voluntary, it's the research, and it's making sure that you have a strong team. So in going from that, Laura, I'm, I'm going to get to meet you in Grapevine, and then are you still teaching for Perf Senior Management Institute? I am indeed, and I'm looking forward yeah. to meeting you. I, I am there in July, so I'm going to meet you a couple of times. So I, I'm oh, on the, well, we'll the July have, class. So We'll have a have fun to, summer together. You'll have to point out the good things to go see in Boston. I haven't ever been to Boston. So um, so continuing on from NASMIA, obviously, as she said, you bring in subject matter experts to try to address this. And, and I've seen some of the experts that come in, and they are certainly experts in their field and have dealt with uh, these situations before and have had tons of, of training in it. So you being one of these experts uh, in, in specializing in dealing with reviewing these things, uh, what are some lessons that you think that just across the board and dealing with these different things that you've learned that if you could tell a chief, if you could tell a leader, um, do these to prepare for what you don't think is going to happen? What what it seems to be a common theme? I think something that's really critically important is when there is something traumatic and tragic that has happened in a community that the community members are looking for leadership. They're looking for direction and some reassurance. And so in that moment, that is a time for a leader to emerge. And when we experienced um, in Tampa, when I was working for the Tampa Police Department, we lost two police officers in a single night. And at that moment, I knew we needed to make sure that we had a, a single voice of strength and calm that could reassure the community. And so we made sure that we had the chief and, and, and the mayor when we could standing beside the chief, that they were speaking with a single voice to the community, letting the community know we've got this and we're using all of our resources to uh, rectify the situation, to bring the person into custody um, and to reassure the community. And unfortunately, that was one of the things that did not happen in Uvalde. There was never a single voice. There was local agencies talking, state agencies talking, um, and and they didn't know that the that they were they didn't even realize that that both of them were talking and, and covering different information. And so the community can get mixed messages, and that can. Um, undermine that feeling of confidence. And I think it also uh, interferes with the ability for the, the community to begin to heal. It's so important for that voice, that leader, to unite the community, that they go through this together and somehow become stronger on the other side of it. And when there is that lack of leadership, um, that interrupts that whole process. You start getting the, the mixed messages from different leaders because all of them hold a high position. In, in Uvalde, you had the director of DPS. You had the chief of police of Uvalde. You had the chief of Uvalde ISD. And if those are not on the same page, then, then yeah, it's, it's you know, uh, what confidence do you have in what they're telling you next? Right. And I think that was, that was one of the things that we saw a lot of in Uvalde. Um, there were two news conferences by the local um, school district, and then the state took it over. But the state never told the community, we're taking over this investigation, we're taking over the communications, we'll be the official source of information. So uh, I think there was just a lot of confusion, confusion reigned uh, in Uvalde. I, I agree. And, and speaking of that, um, you know, we'll bring Judy on to speak about the fact of having your messages together, having your critical incident plan together, having that communication plan together. and. It's certainly an expert in that field coming from the media and then working for many police agencies and uh, authoring uh, the COPS Office Guide Strategic Communication for Law Enforcement Executives. Uh, Judy, speak to the fact of um, you know how to prepare and what messaging needs to happen and the plan before an incident happens. Yeah, I mean, it's so important. Um, you know, so many people look at communication and they say, oh, you know, we've got to put out this fire. There's so much work that needs to happen before the incident. And any police leader who thinks that, you know, the bad thing's never going to happen to me uh, is dreaming because it's, you know, it's, it's a matter of, of when, not if. And the planning that, that planning or the things that have to happen before a crisis 
Um, I, I'm not sure if they did happen in that situation. So, you know, how much planning did they do? How much crisis communications guides did they have put in place? How much work had they done together um, in doing desktop, de excuse me, desktop simulations? Um, relationships, were there strong relationships that were built? I, a lot of that is questionable because in a crisis, the person who, you know, framed that narrative first is going to be the one that is going to be the leader. And going back to basic NIMS and ICS, even the fact a joint information center can be extraordinarily helpful so everyone is singing from the same song sheet. That doesn't mean that one person is a singular person delivering the message. What it does mean, however, is that it's coordinated. And, you know, the ISD are talking about what the ISD needs to be talking about. The mayor's office is talking about the mayor's office, the police, the DPS. Everyone is in their lane, but it's a coordinated message. Uh, the confusion that, that reigned publicly really just took away from the message and just extended the crises, which I would suggest that crisis is still not over. Um, they're still in a position where people feel like that they're, they're still victimized and good crisis communication takes people from feeling as like they're victims to feeling as their survivors. Yeah, we talk about the fact of communications and planning and something, I guess it's really not new anymore, but I still consider it new is when we talk about communication, we're thinking about the, the police chief, the mayor, the, the city manager behind a mic. But that's not the case anymore. I mean, now you have to have social media in place and you've got uh, citizens that are playing a part of this. They're sending out the message, too. If, if you're not controlling the message, if you're not giving information, they're going to find it or they're going to produce it, whether real or not, through third or fourth party information. So, you know. And as you said, you know, did they have a plan? I did a previous interview, actually the the one before this one, uh, and, and learned along the way that you know the the police chief in Uvalde uh, didn't even have policies in place. Uh, so I know he didn't have a critical incident plan. He didn't have policies in place. The policies they found actually had a it was just a school district out of the city of Houston area and had just changed the name from that to Uvalde ISD. I can tell you that a school in Houston is much different than a school in Uvalde, but it also tells me you haven't put time and thought into the possibility of this ever happening in Uvalde. And obviously, I think there's many chiefs that would say it's never going to happen here. And as you said, it's, it's the worst thing you can do is just not prepare uh, to, to have those things. But speaking about the social media part and the extension of that, I know that you talk about it greatly in your classes, Judy. If you could just spend a little time on how do you prepare for that? How is that part of the plan? Well, a, a big part of it, and, and I'm sure you know everyone's going to agree on this, social media is where typically crises are going to break nowadays. Uh, first of all, the most important thing is are you, you know, are you monitoring social media? Do you have something in place for social media listening? That's where the crises are going to break. You have to be prepared to start framing your narrative on social media. Not only that, is that is where the disinformation and the misinformation is going to start. Today, um, not only are people just, you know, just making mistakes by putting out information or what they think, but we also have malicious actors that are using social media and that are using these crisis incidents to create anger, fear, and divisiveness in our communities to, to, to negatively affect not only the perception of law enforcement, but the overall perception of safety. So social media is playing a significant role in crisis management today. And any police leader who is not maintaining a social media presence is absolutely missing the boat when it comes to crisis management. Now, uh, Lauren, speaking uh, of the social media, I know that there's a balance as a police chief between getting information out quickly and making sure you have the right information. And sometimes it's <clears throat> it's not the chief, it's not the CEO that should be putting this out because they're not close enough to the information. But how long, I mean, what would you say is, is a time frame of making sure what you're getting out is right or, I guess, correcting it quickly? What What would be the best procedure for that, I guess? 
I think within 10, 15 minutes of an incident happening, you know that you have a confirmed critical incident. You should be on social media letting the community know we have an incident. Um, you don't have to give all the details. You don't have to know everything. That's the beauty of social media. It's just getting in the driver's seat and letting them know, okay, we're going to be up front. We're going to be transparent. We're here. We got this. Um, and ironically, in Uvalde, 10 minutes, after the incident happened, the first post appeared. And it appeared at that point, oh, this is going to be, um, you know, handled gonna well. going to communicate because, well. <laughs> yes, because 10 minutes out, they're saying, okay, avoid this area. We have a large police presence. They're, they appear to be getting into the driver's seat. But then there is a, a post that comes 33 minutes after the shooting has started inside the school, and that is a post from the school district saying that the students are safe, that the, the staff are safe in the buildings. And that information was never corrected. And wow. that was a, a very significant flaw for the Uvalde situation. And I think the lesson learned for other agencies is when you make a mistake, and we do make mistakes under duress and, and high stress, uh, situations that are dynamic and unfolding, we have to correct them right away. We got to jump out front, own the error, explain how the error happened, and then give the correct information and move on. Would you Would you agree with that, Judy? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think you know you talk about the fact that there, you don't have to know a lot to to what Laura's saying is being in the driver's seat. But being the one to seize the narrative and say, this is where your information is going to be coming from is absolutely important. Because if you don't fill that void, that void will be filled. And long gone mm -hmm. are the days for law enforcement. It's like we're not going to say anything until we know everything. That's not going to work because that void will be filled. And we want to be the people that are putting out the information, putting out the correct information, and then correcting any misinformation. So I can't imagine being a parent and, and seeing the social media post, everyone's okay, and then mm -hmm. getting there to find out that your child's been murdered and that it was never – I mean, not that it's going to – not that it will change any impact to you in your life, but, I mean, the fact that it was said and never brought up again. And as me and I were together when we interviewed the communications person who put out um, that message and we asked her, uh, why did you put out that message? And she said, well, it had always been correct in the past. And we discovered that they oh, wow. were using a template of whenever they had any type of critical incident, they used a template wording. And having templates is actually a good thing. It's something that I teach. You should develop your your template state, they have to be customized to the incident at hand. But having some of that wording in the can is a good thing so that you're prepared, but you you have to make sure that you're amending that information and and, and customizing it to the, the actual critical incident that's unfolding. You know, and Dan, that also goes to a very important point, is that that communication strategist has to be sitting in the right place. So, you know, if we go to NIMS and ICS, you know, the communications person, the PIO, whatever name you want to give that, is reporting directly to that incident commander. Many, many police agencies have their PIO somewhere down in the command structure, and it, it changes the message or they're not getting information or correct information in a timely manner. That is absolutely key in crisis. Well, them being in the right spot to have the, as soon as the, I say the right people, as soon as the right people are getting the info, they should be standing right next to them and, and to understand what needs to go out. And there may be some things that don't need to go out that you're getting, but they need to know both of those things. I know we've been talking for a little bit and uh, Nazmia has, uh, has set back on, on some of these. Uh, and I know she has uh, tons of information herself. So, um, as Mia, your your uh, thoughts as far as uh, the communication aspect of this? I know that uh, you've seen a couple of these. You've been heavily involved in a couple of these. Uh, where do you see some some failures and, and lessons to improve? 
Yes, thank you. Um, I agree with everything that Laura and Judy have shared already. Um, just so that I don't repeat the, um, some of their aspects, I do want to uh, tie in one piece, Dan, that you started talking about is kind of the trauma of of this, and really the accu- why we want to have be so accurate with our communications. And I know Laura can speak to this as well, but the the trauma of some of the messaging that came out after Evaldi. Um, you know, some some of the families we spoke to was about how some of the lack of communication and the misinformation really just added to the harm and the hurt that occurred with them. And so I think that it's also important to be thinking about this from a trauma perspective and also thinking about not only the, the communications that's provided over social media or press releases and press conferences, but also thinking about the way communication occurs verbally. I'll just give one um, example that we talk about in the critical incident review report. Uh, when um, the parents were gathering at the reunification center, which is what they called it um, there in Uvalde that day, um, at this point, all of the reunifications had occurred and the families had it, it slimmed down in terms of the families that were left in the space. And there was a lack of information being provided to the families that were there. And, you know, there was a, a asking over and over again for information about their children. And the first official information that is provided was the fact that they were going to be needing DNA from all of the families that were present. Wow. That, that sends a message. And, and that's not a press release. That's not social media. That is something, you know, an official standing up and officially, you know, communicating information. So I think it's important as we're having these conversations, we're also thinking about, the communication and the impact of what that was as the first official information being provided to these parents. Yeah. The reality that if you're standing in this circle, your child's probably been killed. And and that's exactly what some of the families said. They, um, at that point, the governor had already said on a previous unrelated press conference had already referenced the number of people killed um, during this incident. And so one of the family members stood up and counted the families present and said, you've got all those families here. And so I think that um, we have to think about balancing accuracy of information with the manner and the approach of sharing that information and and being as transparent as possible. And so I think those are important pieces. Um, The final thing I would say, and, and I know Laura can talk about this in particular, but a lot of these communication skills that we're talking about and these approaches and these strategies apply not just with an active threat or a mass casualty or a mass violence incident. These can be applied to mass protests, mass demonstrations, any sort of critical incident. And um, maybe I could just quickly turn to Laura because I know she's done some great work um, post-Ferguson and just briefly talk about that. I know it's a little out of scope, but I think it's important that we're not talking about individual skills for an, uh, a mass casualty incident. Sure, and no, it's it's not out of scope at all. It's uh, you know, it's the purpose we're here is to how to communicate with the public uh, whenever any of these incidents happen. So, yeah, certainly, Laura, what's, what's your insight? Um, Post Ferguson, what, I, what, what did you, what were you asking, Ismia? Really about um, communication skills with protests and demonstrations and just kind of tying in how a lot of these, the strategies we're talking about with mass mm-hmm. violence incidents can apply to other type of critical incidents like mass protests. I think it's so important to have the discussions beforehand with your team and with all the the uh, potential partners that could be involved with the protest. We see these um, incidents unfolding across the country right now on university campuses, and there are multiple parties involved. You have the campus police, you have the local police, you have the state police, you have the university. And so in your area, in your jurisdiction, you should know who your partners are ahead of time and build those relationships and have a game plan of who is going to take the lead and then how are you going to structure it um, for releasing information? Um, And how do you make sure that everyone's voice is represented and that you don't have different voices speaking at the same time um, and giving, maybe not intentionally, but just because you have two voices speaking, sometimes you'll, you'll end up giving out conflicting information. And then as Judy had referenced earlier, the importance of jumping out and making sure that you are becoming the official voice and letting people know, this is going to be our coordinated response. This is where you're going to get information. So people 
know where to turn to get that information. Because when you have something like uh, protests that are turning into civil unrest and, and there's threats of violence um, and property damage in your community, people are fearful and they're looking for uh, information. And so being very proactive in your messaging is critically important. Uh, uh, Nazmi, uh, one thing I want to touch on as far as, um, you know, certain agencies, and I'm thinking of the Department of Justice, and I may be off off on this, that it's in a, a totally separate area, but when you have an agency that, you know, has, you know, civil rights violations, all these problems, the Department of Justice comes in and puts them under consent decree, and they list out all these things that they need to do, is that sometimes, or is that end up being a result following these critical incidents, or is that something totally separate? Yeah, so uh, really those types of investigations and those consent decrees are a separate um, component within the Department of Justice. That's typically coming out of the Civil Rights Division, the U.S. Attorney's Offices, the Federal Bureau of Investigations. Cops Office and, and the work that we do are not investigations, and so um, there are separate kind of tracks, as you will, um, we try to be very clear in the work we do, including what we did out in Uvalde, that it is not an investigation. It is a review, an assessment. And so um, we do try to keep those separate tracks. Um, and then, uh, but to say we always do coordinate um, before we launch a review or a training or technical assistance with an agency to make sure that um, we're not getting in the way if there is an investigation. So, so, the, so the COP's main purpose is uh, to do a review uh, to, as I said, not an investigation, but just a review on better practices and how to improve in the future, I guess, or, or I guess what had happened. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in particular for what we did in Uvalde, it was three goals that we had was one was to provide an authoritative accounting of what actually occurred that day, what led up to that day, and what occurred the uh, following days, weeks, and months. The second was to be able to provide practices and strategies and lessons learned for the field. How can we think about areas to improve upon, to raise up promising practices um, in the variety of areas that we looked at as part of the report, including communications. And the third area and, and most important was really to provide answers and to, and to honor the families and the victims and those that lives were lost and those that were impacted by that. And so for us, that, that was the three goals that we followed um, with all of our work. Um, and that is also really in line with the work that we do at the COPS office in this, in this type of area. And I think, uh, you know, the third one being very important, especially in this situation where I think the families, even to this day, uh, have questions uh, about what happened. And I think that uh, that review and the information put together is so important for them. You know, it, you know, I worked homicide and violent crimes for 17 years. I'm not sure the word closure uh, ever means anything uh, to a family that's received that type of trauma, but at least there's information uh, that's given. So on these reviews, and you all have gone down to Uvalde and talked to families, so how long is it? Is it, I guess, a set process? Is this months that you all do this? What's uh, What do you all look at on that? It is a process. Um, so we do a lot of data collection, a lot of data analysis. We do direct interviews. We do direct observations, focus groups, a lot of policy review, document review. Um, in particular for this incident, we looked at over 14,000 pieces of data, documentation, videos, uh, audio, images. And as part of that, we for this one in particular, we, look, we did over 260 direct interviews, as well as ob observing the interviews that were conducted as part of the other investigations. And so it, it does take time. Um, and this in particular, it was about a 20 month process that tends to be around what we're looking at for our previous work. Sometimes it can be about 12 months, sometimes it can be two years. It really varies on the scope. It varies on the responsiveness of the agency. It really just varies on a, a lot of different aspects of it. 
And so um, I think, you know, in line, we were doing everything we could to balance out accuracy of the information in the report, as well as getting this out in a timely manner. And I think always accuracy is important, but I think with so much of what we saw around misinformation, the lack of information, it was really important for us that we were able to triple check every single detail and every single fact that we included in the report, because we didn't want to contribute to the misinformation and the lack of information. Yeah, by all means, if uh, if it's coming out as the official report after the misinformation already received, that's, you know, uh, there's already a credibility issue, and certainly we don't want it in the what we would consider the official review by the Department of Justice. But uh, I appreciate all of y'all and the time you took in Uvalde. I appreciate the time that you're taking today, and I look very forward to uh, watching y'all's presentation at uh, Grapevine Techs at the Great uh, Wolf Lodge. Uh, for those that are planning on attending that, if you've never been to the Great Wolf Lodge before, it's an indoor water park. Bring your kids. They can play and run around the, the hotel with magic wands doing some adventures while uh, you're in this conference. Uh, unless they're too young to be on their own, I'll let you determine that. Uh, but come on out and, and see these uh, three amazing people that have uh, worked on some very incredible cases. So, uh, Lays, I appreciate uh, you just taking the time today. I look forward to meeting all y'all and, and possibly have another conversation in the future. Thank Thanks, you Dan. so much. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for listening to Crime Scene today. If there's a topic that you'd like covered, if there's a guest you'd like on the show, or if you'd like to sponsor the show, you can reach out to me at dan at crimescenetoday.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>